Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the Quick Cast. I know it's been a while since our last episode, but good news, this is a great one. Those of you who have missed the QTP episodes that we've been doing in the past, we are circling back around to do a new Question the Premise episode with Claire Taylor of Reclaim Your Author Career Fame. And I am so excited to have Claire here. We're going to question the premise of you should do all the things, which we all know we shouldn't, but somehow we still feel like we should. So let's watch Claire Taylor and Becca Syme. Take it away, Claire and Becca. So we just had Claire on probably one of the very recent episodes. (laughs) <laughs> because Becca has taken a hiatus from recording uh, for quite a while and has been in the middle of burnout. I'm getting better. I am okay. Uh, don't worry about me. But uh, we are back a little bit now. And I'm here with Claire Taylor, H. Claire Taylor, also known as, um, who wrote the book, Reclaim Your Author Career and is an Enneagram coach for authors. Thank you for being here, Claire. I'm very excited. Of course, anytime. You just say the word and I show up. If you say I know, Enneagram I'm so excited. Times, right? I appear. I'm, yeah. I am so excited. <laughs> we have so many things planned for the future. I cannot tell any of them to you, um, but we have so many things planned. And one of them is that I'm going to announce first is that Claire is coming to our in-person conference in Minnesota in October. And Claire's going to do like a whole presentation on the Enneagram, which I am super excited about. And before we begin, before we begin, uh, let me just say, I'm not one who's usually like, you need to come to this thing because I feel like people need to make their own decisions. But what ends up happening when I let people make their own decisions is nobody knows what's happening. In fact, I have now contacted six different people to come to this, like to be on panels at this conference. And all of them were like, oh my gosh, I didn't even know you were running a conference. And they're all on the Patreon. So I'm like, Am I just really, really bad at telling people that stuff is happening? So here it is. Stuff is happening. We will have a link in the show notes. You'll be able to go and read Claire's bio and read all about the conference and sign up for the conference. But for now, I want to say the conference, as is everything that we do, and the reason that Claire's here is because we do such similar work with authors in terms of everything is about alignment and our goal in the BFA And I think Claire's goal, probably in the work she does as well, is to just make sure that everybody's back cracked, like we're spine straight the way we're supposed to be. And uh, and we are going to do a lot of that. There will be a lot of back cracking happening at the Conference of Minnesota. I'm very excited for it. I can't say anything else, but uh, more will be forthcoming. So because you're here today to talk about the... Uh, topic. So Claire coaches a lot of authors. And I'm always fascinated when I talk to other author coaches, like what are, what is it that you're seeing? So talk to me a little bit about your favorite moments of coaching. Like what's the thing you loved the most about coaching sessions with authors? So when I'm coaching authors, I am looking specifically at their core motivations and the patterns of attention that arise from that, which is what the Enneagram measures. So that is the starting point for me. And that is how I am sorting the information that they're giving me through a questionnaire that they fill out ahead of time. So what I like, my favorite part of coaching is when I'm working with someone and the core fear and the core desire click and they start to and i describe maybe a pattern of attention that comes from that so a pattern of attention is um where are we putting our attention and and spoiler we're putting our attention toward what we fear the most right if you're in the room with you know a, a chocolate bar and a live rattlesnake which one is getting your attention you may really love chocolate but you're looking at the snake. So when we decide what our core fear is, or when we, we discover that, we know what snake is getting all of our attention. 
Um, so we then know how we are relating to the world and it's to avoid that snake, to avoid that particular threat. And there are nine different threats that we all feel. And so, um, so that attention leads to certain cognitive, emotional, and behavioral patterns. So thinking, feeling, and doing patterns that are to accommodate that fear. And we know what those look like in the Enneagram. It's been, you know, described. So I'll start to say, well, this may be what you're feeling. Do you experience this emotion a lot? And usually, initially, the, the client will go, oh, uh, yeah, I mean, I do, but not more than anyone else. And in, in my head, I'm going, mm, we may but not don't be you? fully aware of the water we're swimming in. Um, so then once it clicks and they and this is usually once they start to see and understand another lens from their own then they can look back on their own and go oh this isn't reality this is just the lens and the information that particular lens is allowing through mm. so then it's this moment of we look back along the you know the arrow of time from where we are now and we see these patterns start to emerge in our life and it's this aha moment of oh i was actually doing all of these things to avoid this snake that has scared the absolute crap out of me. And uh, so that's that's the good moment where it's like, oh, I, I am doing that. And then we continue to talk about some of their, you know, some of their marketing or their writing process or goals. And they start to see with, of course, it can help that I'm there and I go, well, that seems a little bit like you're doing this thing. And they're like, oh, you're right, I am doing this thing. Um, they start to realize how much of what they have been doing feeling and thinking is not the only option and that's really that aha moment it, it feels very freeing to notice mm. that that sort of core pattern we've been in yeah it's interesting because the the strengths in the enneagram we talked in our last video about where they're similar and where they're different and i think where they're similar is that's also what I love about strengths coaching, right? Is the the moment when people sort of see themselves for who they really are and know that it's okay to be that way. And they don't have to be any different from how they are in order to get what they want. And I think this kind of um, intuition or insight or instinct that you have with any grammar that I have with strengths is it allows people to have a lot of freedom in the way that they take action. And I think when I, when I look at the book that you wrote, the Claire wrote the reclaim your author career. Um, my first thought when I heard that title was, I don't know that people understand that their career is out of their control right now. Like, like a true number one strategic, Claire's five moves ahead of us, right? And she's like, no, what you really need is to reclaim your author career. And I'm like, oh, they need to understand that they don't have control over it first, which I think is like that moment of clarity that a lot of people have when they go looking for that book is sort of mm -hmm. like, this is what you have. But I would actually say way, way more of us, our career is out of our control than we even realize. And a lot of people who, and some of us, it's not right. Like for some of us, you don't need to listen to this. You're fine. Just go to sleep and we'll lull you to sleep. It'll be fine. But the way that, the way that people feel, they so often don't instinctively know that there's something wrong with that way of feeling that would be changed by aligning something. And so when people come to me or come to you and they're like, I'm having this problem, how do I fix this problem? And I'm like, that's not the problem you're really having though. There's this other problem that we need to talk about and they don't like that feeling at first. And then it's like, oh, no, no, no. I'm so much more free now. And, and I heard a lot of that when you were describing your process. I'm like, yes, that is the best moment in coaching is when people recognize that there is a level of freedom that they don't really know that they need, but they really, really need. Right. And that freedom is, is an essential element of the Enneagram. It's the highest level of development for each type is called liberation. And what that means is a liberation from the, um, 
ego need essentially from from our ego tr constantly trying to seek something and avoid something and it, it just does that on autopilot it's just a script that runs until we interrupt it and so only in interrupting that frequently through practice for our whole lives <laughs> do we stand a chance of having those moments of feeling free from it and now we can experience those moments accidentally uh from time yeah. to time when you're yep. really into something when you're really in the moment and you're you're very present moments of presence will uh sort of fulfill the core desire in a really healthy way and neutralize the fear because you're just not thinking about it you're very in the moment the moment has everything you need and it's, it's perfect and all that and then you feel that liberation and it feels really good so with the enneagram we're learning uh what is keeping us from experiencing that more frequently and then we can start to get to the point where we can experience that intentionally. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't think it's a surprise, hopefully, to everybody in who's been watching and listening to me recently. Um, I know I haven't been doing a lot of quick cast videos, but I've been posting a lot on social media and on the Patreon and talking about this. Um, the fact that Claire and I have been doing some work on my Enneagram as well, like in the last several months, um, that has been super, super pivotal in me letting go of some of the expectations that even as an individualization significance, even as somebody who understands how different everyone is on a very finite level and wants to do something that is the most important thing that I could possibly do with my life, with the, the abilities that I have been given, even then I still question if I'm doing the right thing all the time because I'm constantly being driven by this fear that I have about my, that is the like core fear of my Enneagram type. What's really interesting is that if you watched the last video that Claire and I did, where I was like, I'm a hundred percent sure that I'm a one hundred percent sure, no question. And lo and behold, discovered that's definitely not true, but, <laughs> but in a way that was really beneficial to me, because I think I needed to believe that at first so that I was safe from feeling the real fear, which was when I, when I read that sentence for the first time and really let myself feel what that felt like that fear, it was the most terrified that I remember, right? Like it was just so like the rattlesnake that you described, right? What's fascinating is that even as self-aware as I was, even as much inner development and as much therapy and as much work as I've done, there still wasn't really anything that could touch that particular live wire in the way that the Enneagram did, which is part of why I still just think, and I know Claire and I've said this before, like strengths and Enneagram make such a good partnership, but they really do, you, you really do need to do both of them on some level. Like, I'm not sure that it's possible to really get where you want to go in the best way possible. And, and we'll talk about this as well in a second in terms of why I think it's so important to only do the things that you should, that you are the best at and why it's only really worth your time to be focusing in on the things that will make the most impact on your business instead of doing all the things, right? Which is... <laughs> Those are the most painful moments. Uh, just prepping Claire that that's the next question that's coming up is the most painful moments in coaching. We get to talk about the fun stuff first, which is the switch for me. I usually do the bad news first, but I wanted to start off with the good because the when the good is good, it's so good. But I'm a firm believer in this because we've been doing work on my Enneagram and it has been just unlike anything uh, that I've done, which has been amazing. Oh, but it's also brutal. It's horrible. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't force this on anyone, right? No. It's an invitation because if you are not yeah. ready for it, you are so not ready for it. This is not the woo-woo. Yeah. We're just going to sit and meditate and get in touch with our divine. No, you are about to get smacked upside the head when you start to do this. And it's going to be during the moments when you're like, this is going great. I'm making so much progress. And then you're going to get smacked upside the head and yes. you're going to go, ow, 
do I really want to do this? Maybe I want to go back to the ignorance. Yeah. Yep. Which is great, I think, to say that because in those cases, like I think a lot of people go through times where they're like, I am not interested in doing that work right now. And I'm like, great, strengths is here for you. Like, because strengths does not require that level of vulnerability unless you want to go there. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of the strengths message that is very much just if you, if all you ever focus on is the balconies and all you ever focus on is the strengths themselves, there's a lot of numbness that can happen when you're just trying to be as successful as you can possibly be. And then the Enneagram is there if you want to do the ascendant work, right? Because development work with strengths is very different. And this is why I think it's important for me to acknowledge the, the importance of doing consistent work part between the two programs is going to be very similar, right? Like doing Enneagram work consistently and doing strengths work consistently are important not everybody can do both at the same time, mm -hmm. right? But strengths work is very, very different. Like the goal of strengths work is often not emotional on the same level that a lot of the Enneagram work is. And so I know that there are going to be people who will prefer focusing on strengths for times um, when they're not in that place. And I'm okay with that. But, um, but I really think for our long-term sustainability, that both of them are super important and just read Claire's book. Like if you want to get a primer, read, reclaim your author career. Right. And I don't think there's anything wrong with taking breaks from hundred percent kind of work that you do in the Enneagram. I, in fact, I think that it is necessary because there are some times yeah. when you just need a break and you'll, you'll revert back into the old behavioral patterns, old thinking and feeling patterns, but you won't be completely where you were before. You can't. Yeah. Once you yeah. have that learning, you'll go there and you'll be like, oh, no, this was kind of comfortable. Now I really don't feel super comfortable here. So, yep. you know, it, it will it will change, but you got to give yourself rest. And I don't yep. know, I was just thinking uh, uh, about this. You were talking about strengths is really good at telling you how to get to where you're trying to go, right? It's to get to where you want to be sort of thing. Yeah. But I, th I think the Enneagram helps you understand where you want to be because oh. a lot of the times people yeah, don't yeah. know and part yep. of the work is figuring out where is it that you want to be um certain types especially have a hard time because they've never allowed themselves to consider that and so they default to where other people want them to be or where other people are and they just say well sure let's go there yeah yeah, what's interesting too, so after Claire and I had this sort of like watershed moment in Oklahoma, which was really a great watershed moment, um, absolutely just wrecked me, but all in a great way, <laughs> um, and has catapulted my interpersonal development in a way that I really did not expect um, to happen, which is fantastic because I'm learner developer. I always want to ascend farther, right? Like get better. Um, but what was fascinating was because I had been sort of trying to work in an ancillary way on it already, like I hadn't been using the Enneagram, but I had been trying to do this work myself. And then when Claire and I had the conversation and she started using this language that I had been seeing reflected in some of the other work that I was doing, I was already ready for it. Mm -hmm. So some people who are just not ready for it, I feel like that's an intuitive thing. It's just ignore, right? Like ignore, it's fine. Mm -hmm. um, it's not for everybody. Um, but for those of you who are interested, um, the part of the reason that I wanted to bring Claire on and just have this conversation is because we're bringing her to the October conference um, in Minnesota. And there will be a link in the show notes that you can sign up for it. Um, Claire's going to do a presentation. We're going to have a couple of panels that I'm actually really excited about that are strengths focus, like the majority of the content of the, of the conference is going to be strengths and archetypes, but it's also like, we're going to do some Enneagram stuff as well. But what our coaches have been doing, because this blew my mind when I started watching for these patterns. So of course, input learner, all I have been doing is asking Claire questions about the Enneagram, like for months now, and just, it's been great. Um, but what I've realized is as I'm starting to 
because we collect people's Enneagrams because we do the test in our in one of our courses. So I have the information when I'm coaching people on their strengths. And so I would start to see like, oh, an empathy that's a two, empathy that's a three, empathy that's a one, empathy that's a nine are all very different empathies, but they're all similar to each other, which was really, really interesting because I have been looking for, and I don't know if any of you have noticed this in our strengths groups, but we'll get questions about like, well, my intellection, blah, blah, and then a whole bunch of people are like, yes, this is me. And then a lot of people are like, no, it isn't. When it's a strengths thing, I can always see the overlap, right? It's like, well, your intellection strategic and it acts this way, your intellection analytical and it acts this way. But when I can't find the strength overlap pattern, it bugs the living crap out of me. Like to a point where I'm like, okay, I'm just going to ask a question on my Facebook page and see what everybody says and see how everyone answers and then go like try and correlate answers. No help. But when I started looking at the Enneagram, it's like, oh, this really aligns a lot of the answers that I have been looking for, which is not surprising because the Enneagram is so researched and so long-standing and so valid. It's not like, I'm not surprised by it. Um, but what's amazing about it is the the nuance that it allows us to have. So like all of our coaches are all learning about Enneagram now on a much more foundational basis than they had because the combination of the strengths, that's those success behaviors and the way that you are already motivated because you are getting good results out of your success behaviors But then additionally, that core fear, core desire motivation, the combo of those two has been super powerful for us in coaching. Even just the knowledge, like even just knowing what the Enneagram type is has been helpful, let alone the actual work of like development um, has been amazing. But okay, so Claire, I want to ask you the hard question now, Mm -hmm. (laughs) which is, I did not prepare her for any of this, by the way. She literally just showed up. This is the trust. This is the trust. She literally just showed up and was like, I'll talk about whatever you want. I love a challenge. Um, what? Yes, you do. <laughs> you definitely do. What are the most painful coaching sessions that you have um, with anybody? It doesn't have to be just writers, but what are the most painful sessions that you have? Hmm. There are times when I am coaching someone and because of what I know about their type and because I of what I know about what triggers them, seeing that they are in an environment mm. that is not conducive to growing. Where a lot of what we do is we, when we're young, we, st- we already have our type when we're young and we build these defenses to help us survive in the world as kids who don't understand how things work. And then we grow up and those th- same things that those same patterns that, that protected us and helped us survive become what's keeping us from thriving. And so we want to start to take them piece by piece, hold them up to the light, examine them and say, is this still something I need? Where did this come from? Um, and then get rid of it. But sometimes um, when, I'm, when I'm coaching someone, I'll realize that they still need those patterns for protection either it's a marriage, their parents live with them, or, you know, they, whatever the situation is, that it would be too painful for them to, to release those patterns. And that's really hard because I can't help them. And I'm not going to tell them to, you know, yeah, divorce your, your spouse, right? Kick your parent out. I'm not going to tell people to do that. I don't, I don't want that on me. Um, but sometimes I do see that it's you have like responsibility this- high. No. <laughs> oh, because I'm like, I'll tell them responsibility. I'll tell them. <laughs> um, I mean, I, yeah, I don't want to, I don't want to home wreck. Um, mm-hmm. but I do see sometimes that they are in a position where they need to continue to protect themselves. Um, yeah. and in growing, they may bring on punishment that would only put them back into that armor. So yeah. That is really hard because then it's like, well, I don't know what I can help you with that's not going to really disrupt your life. Because when we grow, it can disrupt our life. It can disrupt our relationships. 
it can um <laughs> sorry it is a keep going disruptive process because you're disrupting the patterns and so these patterns a lot of the times the the patterns that you use to attract your spouse um, may not be the healthiest and when you try and change those it will change the equation of that relationship um, now a lot of the times it will change it for the better and the other person is you know they're caught in their patterns and it's going to force them to confront some things and but you know it's kind of a toss-up how people react when you ask them to confront some of their own garbage you know <laughs> like so it, it, that is really hard for me and i've had a few of those and um sometimes it's communities a person's a part of if it's a you know religious community that focuses on obedience and control it can be really hard to work with the enneagram or any any community that focuses on obedience and control um because if it prioritizes that and this could be a family unit as well if it prioritizes that then your liberation is necessarily a threat to it. Yep. yep. Yeah, no, I, those are hard calls. Like those are hard calls to do. It's interesting that the immediate place that I go when I think about the hardest calls that I ever have to do, it's all revolves around the expectations that we have about what we should be getting if we do whatever it is that we're doing, right? Like when someone says, um, well, I've done all the ads and I've taken all the classes and I've done all of this and I've, and it's like, and I'm still not selling. Why am I not selling? And I think those calls are very difficult for me because I always know, always know that it's possible that any individual person who comes to see me is in like the worst moment of their life because you just, that's why some people sign up for coaching, right? It's like, well, I've tried everything else and this is my last ditch effort. Um, and I don't want to have to be the person who's like, have you thought about quitting? Right. Even though I wrote a book called dear writer, you need to quit. The goal of that book was to get you to quit all the other shit. Sorry. So that you don't <laughs> have to quit writing. <laughs> Because, because frankly, all the people who are telling us that all these things that we need to do are right. That's the problem. They're not right for every individual person, but they are right for a segment of people, right? So if you think about, think about a conference that is a giant conference that would have like a hundred people speaking per rotation, right? And you could potentially listen to a hundred different one hour presentations and all of those presentations would be correct. But each one of them is only correct for one person out of a hundred, right? So like maybe 10% of people, let's say. If you don't know a good way to determine whether you are the correct 10% who should be listening to that thing then you're just going to listen to all 100 and then all 100 the next and all 100 the next and all 100 the next. And a lot of us really, really struggle in this industry mm -hmm. with the amount of successful people that there are who are correct about what they're telling people that certain people should do, but they are not correct that every single person should do everything, right? Um, even strengths in Enneagram are not for everyone. Like no individual thing is for absolutely everyone. It doesn't matter what it is. Nothing is for everyone. And the hard part is when I get into those calls, I know how they got there. Like I know they got there by coming into the industry and being an intrepid sold writer who just wants to make money writing or wants to be a full-time writer or wants to be, you know, the next JK Rowling or whatever it is that they want, whatever their goal is, right. That they got into this because they had a very clear desire to do something. And that desire was not shepherded very well because the desire was too wide scattershot, right. It was scattershotted because we don't have a good blueprint naturally inside of ourselves because of biology. We don't have a good blueprint for how to say no to stuff. 
because of very reasonable biological stuff that is for our survival. But that necessarily means that we also don't have a good blueprint for how to say no to things when we really, 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 really want something. And the hardest part about those calls is that I keep wishing that I could have talked to them three years ago or five years ago or 10 years ago, because if they had just known how to say no to the majority of everything, and and I mean the majority, most of us should say no to almost everything that people tell us to do. There are very few things that are for you, like for you personally to do, but all of us feel like we have to do everything regardless. Like I need to fill my plate as full as humanly possible because I don't know what's going to work for me and I need to just try all the things, right? And those are the most painful calls because on some level they are right. The people who are telling them what to do are right, but they're also wrong for that individual person. And it's, it's just, it is the worst part of this industry, how capricious it is. Absolutely. And I, I, when I work with people on the Enneagram, I like to get it down, you know, down to the sort of the basics away from numbers, away from these success markers that people tend to associate with and go, what are you hoping that makes you feel? Yes. That's, that's what they're chasing. They're chasing a feeling. And so oftentimes they may hit that goal and not feel it. And that is big trouble. Yep. So it's really, once you know what you're trying to feel and where that's coming from, you can get that in so many small ways that are in your control. And yep. so then you don't have to play these games. Um, you know, I talk about stupid games and stupid prizes a lot because we, we try and go after the thing. We think we're going after what we really want and we're going after a very hollow version of it. And in the seeking, we're sort of missing that it's already there. So yeah. that's really a lot of the, the the coaching. And I I would love to get people years ago, right before they, but the nature of what I do is people have to be absolutely at their wits end without any new ideas before they're willing to accept something that doesn't follow the same tracks in their mind, heart and body. They have to be like, listen, this can't be it. And I have no freaking clue. What is it? Please just tell me something. Um, it becomes too painful to keep doing what they're doing because the pain of doing what you're doing has to be so, so great before you'll try something new and unfamiliar. Um, so yeah, it's, it's just kind of the nature of it is like, yes, show up. You're in the right place. We're going to take care of you. We're going to figure this out. This is totally doable and joy and freedom are still ahead of you. Yeah. Cause every moment I do think it's possible, like every moment it's possible to turn around something that hasn't been working or to make something out of a career that feels like it's going nowhere or to change something that has been a trajectory that you don't want to be on anymore. Right. Like I, I believe that at any moment is the moment. It doesn't have to be years and years ago. Um, And a lot of us look at like, we get far into the career. We haven't had the success we believed that we should be able to have. We've done all the things we thought we were supposed to do. We don't know if we've done them right or not. And then we're at our wits end, right? So we have that moment of like, do I need to quit this or not? Um, And for some of us, it isn't, do I need to quit writing or not? For some of us, it's, do I need to quit pursuing full-time writing? Do I need to quit being in KU and believing that number one of the store is in front of me? Do I need to quit? Like there are so many possible things that you could feel like you need to quit that are not about you walking away from writing. Because I can just hear some of you right now being like, well, but I would never quit writing so I can stop listening to this BS right now. And I'm like, "Mm, but can you? But (laughs) can you? you pause a lot of things. (laughs) Yes. You can also... You can say, I'm not doing this yet. I'm not doing this right now. And that's the part of the growth is it's so flexible. We want some sort of permanence. We want to say, I'm never going to do that again. We want someone to just be like, okay, forget about this forever. Because then it's like, okay, but that's just not how it is. Things change. And so 
it's really about being able to, with strengths and Enneagram, we're looking at how do we assess ourselves and our needs in this moment and see what's right for it. Yep. Um, yep. Because it's going to change. Yes. Well, and the so, so the piece about this that I love coming back to in terms of like, don't do all the things. Everybody's going to hear like, okay, we get you. Don't do all the things about how am I supposed to choose what to do? And my, um, I really do like the idea of do what only you can do. Not all of us feel super comfortable with that, but I'm going to start in that place. And the reason I want to start there is because in strengths methodology, the whole point of success psychology is that you have a higher capacity in certain areas than in other capacity and then in other areas. If I am really, really excellent at strategic thinking and I'm really, really bad at something else, then all the time I spend doing that other thing, like I get so frustrated when people are like, oh, well, you should be able to spend time developing you know, any single part of you at any time. And I'm like, well, of course you could, but it's a dumb idea. Like it's, have, have you heard me do the math before people? If you have heard the math about the 3000 words per minute, and you still genuinely believe that you want to spend time developing stuff that you're not as good at, that is on you, my bro. You can go ahead and be unsuccessful somewhere else. I am not here for it because I'm so... Like when I watch people and the capacity that they have to develop, and I'll just use Enneagram as an example, because my Enneagram number has some overlap with my significance and connectedness together, right? Like as a pair, the two of them together, I can focus and hone in on the particular behaviors about my those two strengths that are getting co-opted by the fear that is inherent in my Enneagram number, right? So like when I start to get very, very afraid of things that twos get very, very afraid of, then it latches right on to this connectedness and this significance. And if I don't do the work to make those connectedness and significance behaviors stronger, exponentially stronger, then I'm going to continue to get wrapped up in those behaviors every time my fear gets triggered. Conversely, I have a lower empathy, which is also one of the places that you can go to get this same trait, right? That I'm working on in this, in this work. And if I try to work on empathy all day long, like for literally the next 10 years, I am never going to get as far as I will get by working on my individualization or by working on my connectedness. Why would I ever want to do that work when it's going to be so frustrating? It's going to make me want to give up, right? Why would I ever want to do that? So for me, I am a fan of do what only you can do because there are some places where you have 3,000 words a minute capacity and there are some places where you have freaking 150 words a minute capacity and stop hanging out in those places. Clearly, I needed to say that. <laughs> no, I love it. And that's, I mean, with the Enneagram, the whole thing is we have all of the different types in us to some degree, Yep. but we are not all of the different types. We are yep. a part, there is a part to play for us. We are not a one man show. We are playing a part that is crucial. So every type needs to show up because when one is lacking, when the gifts of one type are lacking, everything gets thrown out of the balance. Yep. And so if you're not showing up, then, then things are going to be out of whack. Like it is, you know, sort of your responsibility to, um, to show up in your type uh, and really go with those gifts. We need the joy of the seven. We need the you know boldness of the eight, the peacefulness and serenity of the nine. We need all of these things. And so it's really like, you know, it the idea that you can or should be all the things, that's a fear. That's a fear. It's um, such a fear. Yep. It's a fear that you will disappoint someone who wanted you to be the other, the other things. Yep. Um, and disappointing other people is something that adults have to learn to do. Yeah. <laughs> not Bam. To, not to say you put your, <laughs> put your big kid Bam. pants on, but it's just a fact of life. It's a fact of growing older. 
Um, and it's a fact of finally making yourself proud. Yeah. Yep. So where we're going to end this very, very um, cursory talk. In fact, we were joking as we were prepping to do this discussion. And I was like, well, you know, we tend to talk for a long time when we get mm-hmm. together, especially when we start doing the QTP work like we've been doing. It's like, oh, yeah, here's the Enneagram side. Here's the strength side. Here's the Enneagram side. Here's the sort of like human behavior psychology side, right? Which both of us are super fascinated by. But we end up talking for a long time about things. And, and then we were like, well, but we could just keep talking for forever. It's not like we're going to, this is the tip of the tip of the tip of the iceberg, right? That we could get we nerdy about. We told you all the things. No, like there's a, not even close. <laughs> but also I want to make sure that we get some actionable stuff for people. And uh, Claire is currently reading a book that we read on the Patreon which is called 4,000 Weeks. And uh, I did not plant this. She re- she started reading this on her own. This is not about me. Um, but this is a book that if you're in my Patreon community, you're very familiar with it because we had a fight about it last year, about how painful it is to read this book. So if this is resonating with you, my action point for you, and I'm going to let Claire give her own, My action point for you is to go read the book 4,000 Weeks, and you can send me an email and yell at me about it. If you don't like it, I'm fine with that. But I want you to go and read the book 4,000 Weeks because I think that is the best treatment of why it's important to acknowledge what we can do and what we can't do. And the only way we are going to get past some of this issue of like, but I have to do everything, Becca, but I have to do everything is to acknowledge the fact, well, I'm not going to tell you because you just need to go read the book. And if you've already read the book and you're on the Patreon, go search for 4,000 weeks and start joining the discussion because we'll start having the discussion again. But I think that is one of the most important books that any of us can ever read. And I know some of you hated it, And I'm okay with that because it's going to grow on you at some point in your lifetime. I am convinced, Uh, maybe not, who knows, but um, so Claire, if, if we could do one thing today um, after hearing this discussion, as your activator would tell us to do, like, what would you tell us to do um, to kind of get a, get a nip on this? Oof, man, there's, and you can contextualize it for different types if you want to. Yes. So assuming that people already know their type, um, and I would say that this is just a total caveat, but taking the test does not mean you know your type because the test is only 50 to 60% accurate. Um, It's about a 95% chance that your true uh, dominant type is in your top three or four scores but it's not necessarily your first score. So don't just take that for granted. Go read about your top three or four scores. And if you have questions, come find me, but um, figure out which one relates to the most of your life. So that's your type. All right, so we we aren't taking shortcuts with the test. There's no shortcuts in this journey into self. Um, I wish there were. If there were, I would have found them. Trust me. Right. If there were, we would just tell you what they yeah. are. <laughs> I know. Listen, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to keep you hanging here. Um, no. But let's, let's say that you know your type, you're very confident about it. Um, the first thing that I would do is to look at where that type puts your values. What is it that you value because of your type? So if you are one, you may value responsibility, integrity, choose is going to be caring nurturing helpfulness things like things of that nature so you can read about your type but you'll start to see these themes emerge if you're if you need some sort of starting point but figure out what you value and that is going to be the best criteria for what you keep and what you don't keep if you don't value it you're not building and you're doing it every day because someone told you to but it it doesn't align with your values you're not building a valuable life. So what's the point? Um, So that would be my first step is figure out what your values are and start to hold them up against all of the many things you feel like you should do every day and that you have been doing. 
and don't expect this to be pain free. Bam. <laughs> Bam. This is, this is not, this is not pain-free. Sometimes it's not pain-free. You know, if nope. you dislocate your shoulder, you got to put it back in and that's not yep. a pain-free process, but it nope. has to happen. And then you got to heal. Like, uh -huh. and then after that you got to heal and it sucks. It's painful. Yeah. It's so awful. Okay. So here's the, the encouragement for everybody after you have learned all of this stuff. Claire has a bunch more content. We'll put links in the show notes so you know how to find it. Go read her book. Um, if you are not familiar with a quick cast, we have a whole bunch of QTP episodes behind this that will all be in a playlist that's on the front page of the channel that is entitled Question the Premise or QTP. I can't remember what they're calling it anymore. But go watch a bunch of these because this is essentially what our goal is to do with this content is to say, here's something we're told we have to do. Who does this apply to? So I'm just going to say, do all the things applies to no one, zero of you. So if you are trying to do everything that everyone tells you to do, because you think that's what you have to do in order to succeed, you do not have to do that. It is okay to only do the things that only you can do. And your intuition is likely guiding you there. And you just need to listen to it. But go back and listen to the QTP series. If you are looking for in-person community around these topics, around having more success in your author life, around becoming a liberated writer, around all these things, come to our conference in October. It's not for everyone. I'm just going to tell you that. Like some of you are not in a, you're, you're not traveling or you don't want to do in-person stuff. That's totally fine. Both Claire and I have tons of places you can find us online. It is not hard to find us. Just search. We'll put links in the show notes as well. But if you are interested in doing more in depth in this, you can come to the conference and find us. And we are going to be talking about this very thing at the conference. And I'm so glad that Claire is coming because I think that the combination of strengths at Enneagram in the future, especially for people who are hanging out in this community, um, is going to be really important for us. And like I said, all of our coaches are learning from Claire. We're all trying to figure out how to be helpful. I don't think any of us are anywhere near the point where we can do Enneagram work with you, though. So if you want to do Enneagram work, you need to go to Claire. We're all just learning. And, and we can say, that sounds like a very two version of empathy that you're doing right now. Here's how it might help to work on your empathy in that way. But we are still primarily strengths coaches. We're just learning Enneagram. Go to Claire. She's the Enneagram expert or come to the conference or consume our content. All right. Thank you, Claire, for being here so Thanks much. Thanks so much for having me on. Oh, this is so fun. always fun. Yeah, <laughs> I love we had a blast. The good as values. always. As I know, right? <laughs> I, I gotta too. say the journey is treacherous, but the yeah. company is amazing. So, oh, if you've been around the quick cast for any length of time, you know that we love to question the premise of the things that we subconsciously believe that maybe some of us shouldn't be believing. So if there are other premises that you're holding on to that you're pretty sure you want to question, check out our archives to see if we have addressed any of them. And if we haven't addressed the one that you particularly want us to address, please leave us a comment or go to betterfasteracademy.com and hit the contact button and send us something through the website that says, hey, could you potentially deal with this thing? Because one of the reasons we don't do content every single week is if I don't have anything I feel like I need to say, then that's what happens. I just don't say anything. Um, but we do this rotation of questions in our newsletter, which if you're not signed up for the newsletter, you really should be. It's free. We don't like, you should just sign up for it, but, uh, and you can do that on betterfasteracademy.com. But I do these regular rotations of letters where people will ask like, dear Becca, here's my problem. What do I do about it? And then I answer. 
And what ends up happening in those is we usually question the premise of some, pre like something that we're believing, right? So the helpful part about the Dear Becca letters is they kind of serve as a quick cast episode on their own. They're usually fairly long. Um, unlike the, you know, common wisdom to like, keep everything short, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, well, I got to say what I got to say. I always laugh when we have a marketing manager and when she tells me like, okay, you need to keep the quick cast short to like 20, 25 minutes, 30 minutes at the longest. And I'm like, bro, I mean, in my bro voice, right, bro, <laughs> I can't control because I have to keep going until the question, until the premise is thoroughly questioned, right? I have to just, I can't stop myself. So the downside is my content is at the length that it is, and I'm just one with that. I'm at peace. Um, but it does mean that sometimes the letters get 2,500, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 words, and I just can't help it. The good news is we collect all of them onto the Patreon. So every once in a while, I usually try to do it once a month, but that isn't my, like, you know me, if you've been here any length of time, I don't do anything regularly. I really wish that I could, but you know what? Consistency and discipline are my like 32 and 33. So let's just not expect that from Becca. Probably not going to happen, but I do try to do them as often as I can, and I try for once a month to collect all of the Dear Becca letters and all of the social media posts that I've done that are more blog style and put them all into one post on the Patreon. So generally speaking, if you're on our Patreon, you're getting all the content. Additionally, I try to post them all onto our Better Faster Academy blog. So betterfasteracademy.com blog, just so that we'll have a, an easy place to go to say, oh, you can go look at this. We don't post the Dear Becca letters there, um, but I do try to post anything that's public social media content. So anyway, I wanted you all to know that because I don't want you to follow me everywhere. I don't want you to be on my Instagram and TikTok and Facebook and Twitter. I don't want you to be listening and watching everywhere. And we're going to do everything we can to make some centralized locations for content so that you don't have to be everywhere if you don't want to be. And honestly, I'm a number one input. I do a lot of talking. Well, I'm high communication as well, but I'm a number one input. I like to output and I like to output at volume, right? So I'm probably going to output more content than you're going to want to consume. And it is not a bad thing to not watch every episode of the quick cast, not listen to every podcast episode of the quick cast, not read every letter, not read every social media post. It's a good thing. I'm way too high in input for people to keep up with everything that I do. And I think that's just my Achilles heel. So that's my lot in life. But questioning the premise again, you should do all the things right? Question the premise. No, you shouldn't. And you shouldn't be everywhere, right? Like this is the, this is the essential lesson that we're trying to learn in this episode and the essential lesson that I think the quit cast is all about. What do you quit? What do you keep? And what do you question? So hopefully this has helped today. Thank you so much to Claire for being here. All of the links that we promised will be in the show notes. Thank you, by the way, to our um, podcast editor, Nikki Haverstock, who's also one of our coaches, um, and to our marketing manager, Crystal Shannon, who's also one of our coaches. Um, I really appreciate all the work that y'all do in producing this and just in encouraging me to continue to make content. Because of course, those of you who have been around lately and watching what I'm doing in the summer of 2023 know that I'm pretty burned out and I am trying to do the best that I can to take care of myself first, which often means that I have to do less public stuff, which is okay though. Like it'll be fine. If what I'm doing is helpful, then you'll keep coming back, even if it's not regular content. And if it's not helpful, then you shouldn't come back. So that's that. I mean, that's just the truth of life, but I'm glad you're here. I hope that you'll join us in future episodes as we return to our regularly scheduled programming. Thank you all for being here. We'll see you on the next quick cast. Bye everybody.